Welcome to the Inside Syracuse Basketball Podcast, brought to you by Kraus Health, the official partner of Syracuse Athletics, providing the latest technology and expertise in the treatment of stroke and cardiac emergencies. I'm Mike Waters. Today on the podcast, I'm joined by former Syracuse basketball player Ryan Blackwell. I talked with Ryan about why he initially went to Illinois, why he transferred to Syracuse, his pro career that led him to Japan, where he met his wife and began a career in coaching that continues today at Liverpool High School. Well, welcome back to another edition of the Inside Syracuse Basketball Podcast, brought to you by Krause Health. Um, we have a great guest today, a guy who I've known for quite a while, going back to his high school days in Rochester, and it's former Syracuse player Ryan Blackwell. Ryan, how are you? Good, Mike. Thanks for having me. Well, it, it's kind of weird in a way for me to have you on as a podcast guest because a, a lot of my guests are guys maybe I've lost touch with a little bit or they're out of town. You don't see them as much. I feel like I, in a way I see you all the time and I kind of had a blind spot to getting you on the podcast. And so I apologize for that. I'm, but I'm looking forward to our conversation. Uh, it's all right. I mean, it's true. I see you all the time at games in the dome or practice or whatnot. So it's, I'm probably kind of off your radar, but just because I see you all the time. Hiding in plain sight. Right. <laughs> um, you know, well, you know, I mentioned that you're from Rochester. I knew you back when you were in high school in, in Rochester. And I think that's where a lot of Syracuse fans pick up on your story. And to this day, I, I'll have people ask me, well, why did he go to Illinois at a high school? Yeah. And I mean, I could answer that for them, but I got you here now. So why don't you kind of take me through the why you originally went to Illinois and uh, coming out of Rochester? So, so I was born in Chicago and grew up in uh, actually in Champaign, where you, the U of I is. Um, lived there for almost nine years before moving to Rochester. And I was actually the ball boy for the team. Uh, going back to the, you know, flying Illini with Kendall Gill and Nick Anderson and Steve Bardo and I had connections and ties with Lou Henson and, and Jimmy Collins and Dick Nagy and Mark Coombs that were all the assistants at the time. So uh, I was best friends with Anthony Coombs at the time growing up. One of my childhood friends who's dead, Anthony Coombs, was the assistant and Lou Henson was his great uncle. So um, I had a love and affection for Illinois growing up. And then we ended up moving to uh, Rochester when I was 14. So right before uh, freshman year that summer um and got recruited by both in high school and so kind of was kind of one of those decisions where you know that was my love growing up um and that was what dream that I wanted to do and I just decided at that time that it was you know I wanted to play for Lou Henson and Jimmy Collins and those guys so when I went there as a freshman um we ended up actually played Syracuse the, the year of 96 in Honolulu um, and we were both undefeated. I think we were 11 or 10 to know or something like that. We were both highly ranked and, and they beat us pretty good about 15 or 20. I remember John Wallace giving, you know, giving me a hard time saying you should have came to Illinois, especially after the, or you should have came to Syracuse, especially after they went to the finals in lots of Kentucky. He's like, you see what you missed. And, um, he was right. And then Lou Henson, they kind of forced him out. He was a little bit older. They passed over Jimmy Collins. They hired Lon Kruger as the coach. Great great coach in his own right but you know I felt you know I, I went to Illinois for a reason for those guys and you know I called up Jim Beheim and I said okay I'm ready to transfer back to Syracuse and then in Jim Beheim fashion of course he did sarcastic <laughs> it's about time you know and uh, that's that's the story if Illinois hadn't forced out Lou Henson or if he had retired and they had had promoted Jimmy Collins to the head coaching position would you have stayed that's a great question. That's a great question. Um, there's a there's a strong possibility that if Jimmy had gotten the job, I, I never would have ended up at Syracuse um, because we were so close. You know, he was the one that really recruited me. He came to see me in high school, came to my high school several times and sat in the cafeteria, had lunch with me. And you know, I had known him since I was, you know, eight or nine years old. So we had a, we had a bond. We had a connection. And, uh, you know, it's it, it's a possibility. But, you know, I, I'm glad. In the long run, it worked out the way it did. You know, it's really interesting in a way. Both Jimmy Collins and Dick Nagy, Illinois assistants, were Syracuse natives. Right. 
So these guys from Syracuse recruit you out to Illinois, ironically, where you had grown up. Well, all these guys talk about, you know, the, the best players in Syracuse history and they name, you know, guys from the 80s and 90s. And I always bring up a lot of the older guys around this area. I'm like, what about Jimmy Collins? And they're like, oh, my God, we forgot about that guy. And you know, a lot of the younger guys, they have no idea who he is, but he's one of the best players from this area, if not the best player from Syracuse. Oh, yeah, definitely right up there. And it, 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 he, sh he shouldn't be forgotten. And I, I think, you know, if we keep talking about him, you know, the, the old timers, including myself, uh, we, we remember. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, you mentioned uh, that game that you played when you were at Illinois as a freshman against Syracuse in Honolulu and John Wallace. And that reminded me of a picture that we have from that game. Uh, it's you and John, I think you're uh, there, someone shooting a free throw and you and John are next to each other in the lane, both wearing 44. Do, do, have you ever seen that photo? Because I just thought the two of you just exposed with each other. Someone said that to me a few weeks ago, about a month ago, and I never you – know, I forgot that I even wore 44 at Illinois. Um, I think Jerry G had 32. That was my preferred number. And uh, for some reason, I picked 44. I don't know why I picked 44, but I ended up with 44. You didn't wear 44 when you came to Syracuse. <laughs> why not? Well, I think that was probably for, you know, I think Jim reserved those for guys like John Wallace and maybe Derek Coleman or uh, somebody like that. I think I always wanted 32 anyway. I think 32, growing up, Magic Johnson was my guy. Um, so even in high, uh, in high school or when I was younger, um, I always preferred to have number 32 because of my love for Magic Johnson. Now, back then, when you transferred, you had to sit out a year. And that season you were sitting out, it was a tough one for Syracuse. There was a lot of young kids on that team. Uh, of course, they had lost John Wallace and Lazar Sims from the team the year before that went to the championship game. Yep. Must have been hard in a way. I mean, it's hard already sitting out. It must have been hard watching a team struggle a little bit, knowing you could have helped. That was tough. That was I remember those years and watching Jason Hart. You know, he basically was thrown in the fire as the freshman point guard. And I remember him, him struggling. And having some good games, but he had you know freshman struggles, and you know Jason Apollo and and, and uh, Otis Hill with the seniors, um, and then we went up losing it to Florida State, if I remember, in the NIT. Yeah. So it was just an up and down year, and watching Ty Berg and those guys, but being in practice with them, knowing that I could be on the court with them was was hard. But at the end of the day, I enjoyed, I guess, growing up, uh, getting in the weight room, getting better, practicing every day, and just learning the system and learning what I needed to do for the next year to get to be better and productive. What are the biggest moments that stand out in your three years at Syracuse? Uh, the biggest one, I guess, because I get reminded is the shot against St. John's my sophomore year. That's a big one. Uh, yeah. The um, Big East tournament. Yeah. Uh, I think all the Big East tournaments were, were just great. I mean, just the atmosphere at the, at the Garden, is, as you know, is just like nothing else. Um, losing to Michigan State senior year was tough. Had, you know, we, were, we had them down 16, 17 points at half, whatever it was. And we had a chance, and they ended up coming back. We didn't score for like 10 minutes. And then they, they ended up winning the national championship. Um, you know, losing to Oklahoma State first round my junior year when we were up and down team trying to figure ourselves out. So... I mean, there's so many memories that I can pinpoint. Um, you know, playing Notre Dame and shutting down Troy Murphy every time we played him. Um, <laughs> and then every time I played Villanova, I felt like I had a great game every time we stepped on for Villanova for some reason. That was just my team. You know, it's funny. You mentioned a couple of those tournament losses. Uh, a few of them were preceded by some of the most, you know, game-winning shots, you know, and, and a couple game-winning shots that are sort of forgotten in Syracuse lore. In 1998, in the second round, I think it was the second, no, maybe it was first round even. Iona. It was Iona, and Marius Janoulis hits one at the buzzer. Yep. And before you guys lost to Michigan State your senior year, it was Preston Schumpert with a game-winner against Kentucky. That's right. So, you know. A lot of times you guys always accuse me of like bringing up those losses to Michigan State and Duke and the tournament and, you know, thinking I've always bring up the bad stuff. So I just wanted to throw those out there to you. 
to remind you that I, I can remember some of the wins. Definitely, definitely great memories. Great shot by Preston. Great shot by Marius. Two great shooters in Syracuse history. Um, I actually pulled those up a few months ago, just during the summer, just pulling up old basketball clips and uh, rewatching those. It was great. <laughs> um, when did when you were at Syracuse after transferring? I mean. Did it feel like home again? I mean, were you happy with that transfer? Did you ever feel like, oh, man, I wish I had never even gone to Illinois? No, you know, I, I was, I'm always one that, you know, I, I live with my decisions. I was happy when I went to Illinois. I was 100% sure when I decided to transfer back. Mm -hmm. uh, and even the year I sat out, you know, I said, this is where I am. I'm going to get better. And uh, I'm going to be at Syracuse for the rest of my career, however long that was going to be. And uh, Coach Beheim was great. Um, you know, he started me right away, and he's always honest with me. And uh, as long as, you know, I worked hard and I did the little things I thought to, to stay on the floor and had great teammates and a great culture, and the fans have been great uh, even then and now. So it's a great decision on my part, I think. Um, it certainly worked out. Three NCAA tournaments in three years. You scored over a thousand points. You know, you played in every single game for three years. I think yeah. you started every single game. Correct. That's not yeah. easy to do. Starting every game. I mean, every, at some point, everybody turns an ankle, right? Right. I, that's that's one thing that I was lucky. I never really had a serious injury. No, I've never had surgery. Um, maybe a sprained ankle here and there. I remember the Duke game, but the season was over by then. Uh, in the Sweet 16, our soft, my sophomore year um, in Tropicana, um, sprained my ankle. But other than that, there was nothing really serious, no knee problems. So I was very fortunate and lucky. You know, after your Syracuse career, you played quite a few years professionally. And typical of a lot of guys who have to go overseas. I mean, you're a little bit of a vagabond. Yeah. What was that like as a pro playing in like five, six, seven different countries? I loved it. I loved uh, traveling. Um, I loved, you know, learning about other cultures and you know, making friendships and relationships with other people and other places that, you know, didn't speak the same language and eat the same foods, you know, different customs. You know, I, I, I I've always enjoyed that, you know, France, England, Portugal, and Uruguay and South America, um, traveled to Lebanon, was riding cycling for a month because of basketball one summer, and uh, ended up in Japan my last stint for as a player and for coaching. So I've been in a lot of different places that, you know, if I had just tried to stay here in America and, you know, do the, at that time as a CBA or kept grinding, trying to get back in the NBA. I never would have met the people and done the things I had done. So I enjoyed it. Was there any place you didn't enjoy? <laughs> there are some places I enjoyed less than others. Um, You're so diplomatic. Right. Um, there, Japan was my favorite by far, just culturally. I met my wife over there. Um, the food was great. Just a clean place. You know, just being in that cult, in that country, kids are very respectful, hardworking, and uh, they treated us very well. Before we move on from the end of your playing career to a beginning of an interesting coaching career, um, let me inform our readers that you're listening to the Inside Syracuse Basketball Podcast, which is brought to you now by Krauss Health, providing the latest technology and expertise for the treatment of stroke and cardiac emergencies. All right. So at the end of your playing career, you're in Japan. How did you morph into coaching at that time? How did the coaching thing go? Because that's where you started was coaching yeah. professional basketball in Osaka. So I was playing for Osaka. I think it was 2000, maybe 10 or 11. And, you know, my body, I was probably, I think, 33. And I probably could have squeeze a few more years out if I had, you know, take care of myself and really got in the gym in those summers. But our management came to me and said, what do you think about, we think you could be a coach, our next coach after, you know, at the time it was coach Tanichi and, and my agent, you know, we sat down, had a, a few meetings and talks about it. And I wasn't sure because I wasn't done playing. I saw the itch to play and 
that summer, you know, they, they moved on from Coach Sinichi. They called me and said, uh, we want you to be the next coach. And I was like, so it took me some time. I had to think about it for about a month. And uh, I figured in the long run for my career and financially they were going to pay me more money. I said, I might as well make that transition into coaching. And uh, that's how it happened. What's it like being an American coach overseas? Because I mean, a lot of guys go and play overseas. But what's it like coaching? Because with coaching, you have to communicate with all the all the players. You know, it's funny. It's, it's not just coaching, but I coached a lot of the guys who I just played with. So I was coaching some of my former teammates. I literally a few months before was playing next to them, you know, and going out having dinner and and whatever with with those guys. So and, and complaining about really, the coach. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so. That was interesting. And then obviously we had the translator in Japan. Um, so every day, you know, whenever I would coach and say something, coach would have to translate or the translator would have to translate to the players what I was saying. But basketball terminology, you know, they understood and they understand a lot more English than probably people will realize because they study, they're required to study English six or seven years, I think, growing up. So they understand a lot more English than you probably realize. But uh, it was very interesting, a, a great experience for me um to be able to coach over there and coach you know some of the japanese guys were younger and didn't really know anything about basketball so i really had to take a step back and go back to the fundamentals and i had some older guys a 35 year old teammate lynn washington who was a veteran so you know that dynamic having the younger guys and the older guys and that mix together was was interesting you mentioned earlier you met your wife while in Japan. Did you meet her while you were playing, or did you meet her as you uh, after you had moved into coaching? After I moved into coaching, ironically, she worked at Outback Steakhouse in Osaka. They have an Outback in Osaka? They have, they have everything. In, in, it's very Americanized, very Westernized in Japan. So I tell people that they laugh all the time, like, yeah, they have Outback, they have Chili's, and all these other restaurants. So uh, they, they make it very easy for us to live over there. But yeah, so she was a waitress, and uh, she was actually a foreign, foreign exchange student in America for a couple of years prior to that. So she spoke fluent English, oh, wow. um, so it made it very easy. Wow. Yeah. That, that's amazing. Yeah. So what, what did she think of this American basketball player, you know, this, this tall guy initially? I mean, you know, she came to a game. I think with her friend and her sister or something like that, she enjoyed it. She, she actually, she was a former player. She played basketball growing up. So she liked the game. Uh, so I think it was fun for her to come to, you know, a professional basketball game in Japan and, and see, you know, me coaching and see the Americans and the Japanese players together. And she enjoyed it. She loved it. Apparently. Okay, great. So you coach with your former team in Osaka for a couple of years and then you got a different coaching job with a different team yep. and that didn't go so well. Yeah. Guma was a, uh, basically a, a new franchise in Japan. Mm. Literally I took over, I think in late, I think they were already zero and 14, zero and 16 when I took over. Oh, um, so they were, yeah, they were an expansion team. It wasn't going well. Um, we won our First game, I think my second job, my second game into coaching, um, and we ended up winning. I don't know. We were close to making the playoffs that year. Came close. We didn't make it. And then the next year went back, and uh, a lot of the guys that we had decided to go other places for money because we were a lower expansion team. So uh, I, obviously they're going to go for the money other places. So it was hard to get players in there and with a low salary, low budget. Um, with our form, with our imports and the local guys, it was just tough. It was a, it was a tough situation. And I know you basically the team let you go. Yeah. Yep. Um, must suck to get fired in Japan. <laughs> yeah, it was. Um, and the thing about it's funny because Japanese they 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 try to beat around the bush a little bit instead of saying this is we're gonna. I think so. I said to our translator who was also our assistant coach, you know, because he had mentioned some things, you know, towards the end of that stint 
you know, they're not happy. I was like, well, they're not happy. They should come and talk to me. But they were kind of nervous and scared to tell me that they wanted to release me. I was like, we're not winning. I understand that. Um, circumstances, you know, whatever they may be, it's part of the business. Just be honest and upfront. I'm, I'm okay with that. Everyone gets fired once in a while. It's going to happen at some point in your career. So that was a good learning experience. You know, it's just, it was what it was, but I learned, you know, about myself and about coaching along the way. So it worked out. Yes. Basically as a coach, you're hired to eventually be fired. Yes. Unless you're lucky to have, and when you're, you're like Jim Beheim or Mike Shashevsky, or who knows. Well, Mike Shashevsky was nearly fired at Duke three years in, famously. So, right. and and there are winning coaches who get fired. Absolutely, for whatever reason. So, that's its territory. You've been now, though, the head coach at Liverpool High School here, just outside of Syracuse, for the last seven years. What interested you in coaching at the high school level after being at the pro level overseas for so long so after uh leaving japan i actually went to img for seven months okay down in florida yeah and then i tried then we came back to coach the aba the shockwave that never got off the ground i don't know if you remember that sure so it didn't work out so i was around you know doing training with ben Bellucci and bba and uh, lazar sims connected me with ari lieberman who's now the the ad at liverpool and uh, there was an opening um after they fired the coach here and we sat down and talked and you know i knew a lot about liverpool a lot of friends that graduated from liverpool and spent some time you know working at hooligans back in the day during the summer so you know i i knew the area a little bit the landscape a little bit um and it was a big school and i thought it was a great opportunity to get into coaching and continue to coach could you have imagined at the time when you accept this high school job that you would eventually be entering your eighth year at Liverpool high school. Not at the time. No, you know, it's, I think as coaches, you know, we're ambitious. We want to continue to move on and try to grow and try to get to the next level, whether it's college or back in the, in the pros somewhere. But um, I never would have imagined. I don't think I'd be here for eight years uh, at this point. And um, I'm happy I did it. We've had a lot of great teams, a lot of great players. I made, great relationships with players and, and the faculty and, and, the, and other coaches in, in the area. So uh, it's been a great move for me. Who are your coaching influences? I mean, you've played for Lou Henson. You played for Jim Beheim. So, you you know, let, let's skip over those two. Uh, okay. any, who are your other coaching influences? Mike Krzyzewski, Coach K, I would say. Uh, Jay Wright. Bill Jackson. Um, right, Coach Krzyzewski, in what way? So when I first um, got into coaching, I, I, I looked up a lot of, read some of his stuff, looked up a lot of videos and how he trained kids. Uh, I'd seen him, you know, talk on videos a couple of times about his approach to coaching and how he dealt with players and kids and how he motivated them, you know, mentally um, and kept their, you know, I think he approached the game. Obviously, he has them work hard, but he had the military back, background. But one thing he said that stood out to me was, you know, if you if you believe that you can do something, then you then you should go out and do it. If you work hard enough to do it, then you should be able to do it in front of you know 60, 50, 40,000 people. Um, and that's kind of how I feel with my kids. You know, if you work hard and you believe in yourself, you should be able to perform no matter what. You should never doubt yourself. You should always be confident, uh, but I'm going to ride you. and I'm going to get the best out of you. And I, I think I've always admired that about him. You mentioned Phil Jackson. Yeah, just his, other than the fact that he coached some greats, you know, Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, Shaquille O'Neal. Um, he's won, what, 11 championships. But even with talent, doesn't ha- it's not a guarantee that you're going to win. I just think his approach, his laid back mentality, his demeanor, the way he's handled himself, um, never seemed to get rattled. Um, he kind of did things differently and did yoga with the guys and gave him different books to read. So I've always appreciated his his different approach to the game. Interesting. So any interest in coaching at the college level? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's, as you know, sometimes it's timing. Um, there have been opportunities, you know, I went after LeMoyne a couple of years ago. That didn't work out. I've been approached about some D3 positions and some JUCO positions, but, you know, I'm in a stable place and I think stability is, is key, you know, especially for me. I just got married. I have a daughter who's 15 months old. And as you see it, some coaches jump from one ship to another and it doesn't always work out. Um, maybe they're an assistant and the head coach gets fired and you just never know. And I'm a really about stability right now. I'm in a stable place. I have great leadership here. And Ari Lieberman, the AD, has been great to me. Um, and that's one of the reasons I'm still here. But at some point, uh, I would love the opportunity, if it presents itself, to coach at the collegiate level. What about your alma mater? If there's an opening, 100%, I would, I would love to be on board and, and help those guys and you know, be on the recruiting trail and obviously who wouldn't want to, you know, coach for their alma mater and, and, and help them, you know, get to that next level. You know, another reason you're at Liverpool going into your eighth year is because in seven years, you've won three section three titles and one state championship. You've been very successful. I, I throw that out there just in case any of our listeners, especially if maybe they're not in the immediate area, they don't know how well you've done. Um, You've done exceedingly well with a state title and three section titles. What's been the secret? I think, <laughs> I think that um, one, we've had you know great kids and great support. You know, from like I said, from our administrators have, have backed me and let me do my job, let me do what I do with the kids. And uh, I, I think I've I've stayed true to myself. Like I said, I, I try to stay on the kids as much as possible. Um, you know, I give them, try to give them confidence, try to give them encouragement. Especially these guys are so young, they're emotional. There's a lot going on with these guys in high school. How we remember when we were in high school, how we thought if one little thing was huge. And um, I, I think they, they appreciate that. They appreciate that I did play for Syracuse and I played professionally and coached professionally. And I have all these accolades, but I'm still down to earth. I'm still their coach. Sometimes they see me as like the big brother to them. Um, and, and they're willing to go the extra mile, I think, because, you know, they see that I 100% and genuinely care about it. Well, that's really cool. And it does come across. I've seen you coach in person at Liverpool. Um, and you do have a way with those kids. Um, it, that's, it's a real interesting way that you're able to connect and, and, and work with them. So Yeah, I don't yell at them. Like some coaches are screamers. And they yell all the time. I yell in practice. I yell when I need to. I, I try to prepare them in practice. And I yell at them then during workouts of practice. And I feel like if they're prepared then, then I have to do yes, less yelling during the games. Yeah, I, I think I one game, I, I, th I saw your very first game. That's right. Beville. Oh, I didn't remember the opponent. <laughs> yeah, it was Beville. I remember that. Uh, and yeah, and there was very little screaming, yelling. There was nothing, none of that, actually. Um, you had coached them. It was obvious. Yeah. They, they were ready to go. And it was, a, it was like watching a John Wooden game, only you didn't sit with a rolled-up program in your hand. I really, you did stand. <laughs> I stand the whole game. That's one of the they all. I never sit during games. I'm always standing. <laughs> Um, well, listen, we've gotten near the end of our time here, Ryan, but I want to tell you, it's always a pleasure talking to you. Um, again, my apologies for not getting you on sooner. Um, and if there's any other Syracuse players within the Syracuse area, you're on notice out there, guys. I'm, I'm, I'm not just getting guys out of town anymore. Appreciate it, Mike. Always good to talk to you too. Absolutely, Ryan. And good luck this coming season with the Liverpool Warriors. Thank you. Appreciate it. Brought to you by Krause Health, the official partner of Syracuse Athletics, providing the latest technology and expertise in the treatment of stroke and cardiac emergencies.